ever gotten up out of the grave and never to return to the grave. Amen? Our God lives. I want you to think about that and understand that when crisis comes, when difficulty comes, we Christians have something to talk about. Because it's our joy, it's our hope, it's our strength to say, this is what God has done for me. A couple weeks ago, I talked to you about um, Paul and, and how he understood that he had to forget what was behind him and press on to what's ahead. Yeah, and that's the same thing I want to take you through as we begin this new series called Prize Fighter, okay? And I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'll just put it that way. Um, but we have promises from God. Listen. We, we have the promises of God throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation that speak to our lives that we are not alone, just as Jennifer prayed, that we are never, ever left by the God who loves us and who saves us. This series is built around a Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 coming up on the screen if you'll watch this. It says, do you realize, do you realize that in a race everyone runs but only one person Gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training, and they do it to win a prize that will not fade or that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So Paul says, So I run with purpose in every step, not just shadow boxing. You see, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might be disqualified. And again, this comes from the person of Paul who is uh, attributed more than half, really, really more than 70% of the New Testament. And he says, listen, I want to live with aim. Here's a thought. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Yeah, you ever, ever thought about that before? Yeah, shoot high. I don't know. Aim high. Whatever you want. If maybe you're in the Air Force. We need to aim at something. And too many people, listen... Too many people in our lives, in our families, live with no purpose whatsoever. Why should I get out of bed this morning? Why should I go back to work? Why should I keep loving you? Why should I raise you? Well, it's because God has given us purpose in life, right? I'm not talking to you today about your career and what you've chosen to do for work or your paycheck. I'm talking to you today about the passion that God has put within your heart to live above and beyond what just the world says is okay. It's not about the status quo because I don't believe that God has called any of us to be the status quo. If you're a business owner, you want to do better than you did last year, right? You want to survive. I was talking to some church planners the other day, and we were talking about communities like ours. You know, um, we're in an, a, a down economy. Did you all know that? Some of you, I did, I, you didn't. I've got to tell you, okay? <laughs> we're, we're living in tough days. And did you know that to grow a church in a declining community, if it stays the same, it's really growing? By the way, we're nine years old. The community fellowship is. And we're a lot bigger work when we started, but we've been the same for the last four years. Right at the same. Does that mean that we're declining? No. It means that God is doing something. I really believe that God's doing incredible things. And you and I, without aim, as a church, as an individual, as a business, as a family, as whatever situation you want to take, if we don't have aim, we're in trouble. In school, if you don't know where you're headed, you're in trouble. Why do we do the things we do? I want you to think about that as Paul framed this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. There are a couple of things that he said that are pretty cool phrases here. He says, run to win. <laughs> I don't know about you. I, I don't run a whole lot. Uh, when I do, um, I beat myself up. Because, okay. <laughs> okay. But, but run. And some, by the way, if you ever see me running, you need to watch behind me, okay? Because I'm running from something or there's a, in front of me, okay. <laughs> All right. Or, or there's something we're running to. Um, here's another one. He says, I run with purpose. Again, I'm going to have a purpose if I run. You and I need to have a purpose. Let, here's another one, and the last one, not just shadow boxing. Have you ever watched somebody shadow box before? Here's a thought. Have you ever watched somebody that's scared of their shadow? Um, our first dachshund, his name was Zeke, and Zeke was a, a red, short-haired, sweet little puppy. We, we miss him. He died several years ago. But um, at one of the churches that I pastored, Higston Baptist Church, not Hickston, but Higston Baptist Church, it had this full-length mirror in the women's bathroom, and Julie and I would sometimes clean the church, and, and Zeke would be with us. Yes, we brought a, church, a dog to church, okay. Um, but Zeke would go, and he'd look in the mirror, 
and, and the mirror was leaning against the wall, and then he'd go look around the mirror. <laughs> Where's that dog? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Don't we live that way sometimes? Like shadow boxing. Like, I'm not hitting anything. You and I live life without aim. We're in trouble. We need to understand where we're going. Why am I seeking that degree? Why am I seeking that person? Why do I want that paycheck? Why do I want that child to do well where they are? Well, it's because God has given me purpose to be a dad who loves him, who shows my kids him. Amen? Not only that, God's given me a purpose to be, for me to be a pastor of a church that is doing things in the community to make a difference for Jesus Christ. Maybe you, in your job, He's given you that opportunity to, to minister life and love, God's love, to somebody else. I'm not talking about changing your life or, or changing your career or, or realigning yourself to God's purpose. But if that happens today, so be it. If God gives you purpose or gives you strength, you need to move in that calling. You need to go in that direction. What I am saying is, if God gives you your purpose, run with it. And run after it. And train for it. Jesus came to earth with purpose, right? Jesus came to die. So some of these verses that we're about to look at and the ones we just looked at, really, the ones we're about to look at are echoing, or are being echoed, excuse me, they were echoed by Jesus in another place, and we'll talk about that here in a second. They're found in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, and it's about a purpose. When you know your purpose, you're able to tell somebody your purpose. Let me ask you a question. Don't say it out loud. What is your purpose? My purpose is to be sexy. No, 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 hold on. My purpose is to be, we get, had a blood drive here. Thank you to everybody who gave or tried to give blood. I couldn't give this week because I'd been to Nicaragua last year. You know, just wonderful. But um, um, I had a name, and I wanted to be there, and I wanted to give blood. But here's the deal. If we're not going for some direction, if we're not here for a reason, Isaiah chapter 61. Will you stand with me as we honor God's word? Y'all doing all right? Everybody? Good. Okay, I got 62 pages of notes today. No, I'm just kidding. Isaiah chapter 61, the whole chapter. Here we go. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Is that a good thing? Okay. To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and the prisoners will be freed. Verse 2. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And with it, the day of God's anger against his, their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted in for his glory. Verse 4. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago, and they will revive them though they have been deserted for many generations. Foreigners will be your servants, and they will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord, ministers for our God. And you will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast of their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor, and you will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land. Everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Verse 9. Their descendants will be recognized in honors among the nations. Everyone will realize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation. He has draped me with a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom in his wedding suit or a bride with her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. And everyone will what? Will praise him. And his righteousness will be like a garden in early spring with plants springing up everywhere. Lord Jesus, we pray in these next minutes that you would speak to our hearts about our purpose, our aim, our life. And God, thank you that you have left us here for a reason. God, there's somebody in this room who has never met Jesus, who has never understood what salvation is. I pray that today would be an incredible day, a day of new beginning, a day of a brand new start. God, I also pray for Christians uh, like me, brothers and sisters who have kind of left off purpose. We've left it behind. We've gone a different direction. And God, I pray that you would draw us back to center with you so that we can pursue you, Christ. 
above everything else. And Father, I, I do ask for forgiveness today that there are many, many times that I get distracted because of my choices. Anybody else? And Father, I pray that you would put us on the path, on, on the, the course, on the help us to run with purpose. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you have a plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The verses I just read to you before, maybe you've heard them, seen them, or, or, or something like that. But Jesus got up one Sabbath morning, that was a Saturday morning at the synagogue. He opened the book, or the scroll of Isaiah, and he began to read this. The Sovereign Lord is upon me, and he has appointed me to do these things. And he read them off, and the last thing he said was, all of this that you've just heard read is now fulfilled in your hearing. Let, let me tell you what that meant. If you've ever heard a prophecy or you've heard that something's going to happen in the future, it just happened. Jesus, that sounds arrogant. It sounds very difficult. But it was Jesus saying, listen, you have just seen or you're about to experience the living truth of God in an incredible way. Have you ever experienced God, yes or no? I, I've seen the miracles happen. I, I, I've heard uh, of folks talk about their story about what God has done, how he shows up and how he, how he answers our prayers. And he's going to do it again and again. And he's going to do it through the person of Jesus, many times through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. But understand that God is still in the business of doing miracles. He is not done. When you look at this truth today, I want you to understand that living with purpose, living with understanding, living with the aim that God wants us to have is possible. But too many times, our lives are saturated with the wrong things. Right? Our, our lives can be saturated with the things that lead us, in the wrong or lead us in the wrong direction or that distract us or that take us in a way that we shouldn't go. I want you to think today, what is the purpose that God has given me? Jesus is God. Amen? All right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we got that. But Jesus being that central person who died for us on the cross, we don't have a problem with that. Jesus lived with purpose. You would agree with that? He was constantly living with purpose and doing the things that he was called to do. But Jesus demonstrated that we must have and know and follow or pursue the purpose that God has given to us. So I want you to dig in with me for just a few minutes and think about some things. Number one, we are called by God. Are you, are you called by God? Yeah, you are called by God. Number one, if you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, you need to know today. For the Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be... Thank you. Help me teach this today or think about this today. That our lives are drastically changed because He forgave our sin. It is in the past tense. Forgiven. My life has changed. He has made me righteous. I want you to think about this. God has given us purpose and it comes directly from Him. By the way, where are you looking for purpose today? But where are you going after it? Um, there are lots of different places that we can go for purpose. Uh, maybe it's school or a degree, or maybe it's in a relationship. Be careful where you go for purpose because Satan is a distractor. I heard the phrase last night um, as I was mowing the yard. I listened to podcasts. I listened to sermons, and here's what one of the preachers said. He said, what you gain by deception, you have to keep by deception. That good right there. That'll preach. And I think we've, we've seen that. What we gain by deception. Well, God has spoke to me and I've gone his direction and all that kind of stuff. Well, I want to tell you, if you gain that position that you're in today because you deceive somebody else, you better watch out because Satan's coming back after you. Here's God saying, listen, I want you to understand. I have given you. Here's the deal. I want you to know your purpose. I, I've not called you to live a life of fear. I've not called you to live a life that's just out there... Um, like a fish floundering out of water? No, I've called you to live with purpose and understand what I've given you. How do we know our purpose? Well, we see right here Jesus, when he picked up the scroll, Isaiah 61, he said, this is my purpose. Have you ever had somebody tell you that before? This is my purpose. Um, uh, by the way, I have silenced my phone. I hope you have too. Thank you very much. There's several people texting me. Let me get back to them real quick. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> If you ever had somebody call you before, like a phone call I had last night, and they want to do a survey, or they want, and, and you tell them, I'm sorry, I don't have any time. And they're like, oh, okay, and they keep on, and they keep on. I've had that happen twice lately. Um, just, just wonderful. Sometimes we don't listen because we're so... Sometimes other people don't listen because we're so enamored by the wrong thing. God says, I want you to know your purpose. 
Here's a purpose for you. You ever been pulled over before blue light behind you? Sir, I have a purpose. Do you know why I pulled you over? No, sir, I don't know why you pulled me over. You were speeding. That guy had a purpose, didn't he? Anybody else ever shown up with purpose? Yeah, the kid didn't bring home the report card? I guess there was a purpose behind that. Amen? Thank God for power school in Henry County. We can find out ourselves. Okay? Some of you don't know that's Ryan. He's my son. I love Ryan. We're going to look at power school later. I, no, seriously. Purpose. We do things with purpose, right? I go across the street to the gas station, and i I, I got to have gas, got to have fuel. We do it with purpose, and we need to do that in our own lives. Jesus stood, and he said, the things that I'm about to say, no, the things that I just said to you, this is my purpose in life. God has appointed me. He is with me, and I need to tell the poor that, listen, here's resources. I need to tell the captive, listen, you can be released. I sat with a, a chaplain from... Um, the jail, a jail chaplain the other day and was talking to me about these ladies that are doing Bible study that are finding Jesus behind bars and how incredible it is to find release in a place where it seems like there's so much captivity. Jesus' purpose was there. Um, his purpose, let me give you some thoughts. Number one, he, he said, Within my purpose, I am being led by the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 3, verse number 21, it said, Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven opened up. If you go to that scripture again, it'll say that God, a voice from heaven came, and the Spirit was definitely upon him. Romans 8, 14, for all who have been led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you ever have that inner voice that tells you to do what's right, go the right direction, that is the Holy Spirit of God inside of us, and we need to be following the Spirit of God. Amen? Think about that. It is Jesus was sent by God. Therefore, you were made by God. You were given purpose from God, therefore God has a word from you, and we need to seek that purpose. Saw a picture yesterday, push, P-U-S-H. Pray until something happens, right? Why? Because God wants to speak to his people. He wants to give us his truth. He wants to take us his direction. And Jesus said, as he, as he read those verses, he said, I, I'm here to proclaim good news to the poor. I, I am here to proclaim comfort to the brokenhearted. You know, one of the greatest places that you can be, not open your mouth, but keep your mouth closed, is when somebody is broken and you can sit and hold them. This afternoon, I get to go sit with a family whose mother at 95 years old died yesterday. Pray for the Seagull family, okay? Um, and really, my job is to preach the funeral, but my job is really to minister to that family that God wants to heal the broken. Isn't that who Jesus is? He said, he, he has claimed, Jesus said, he, he has told me to proclaim release to the captive. Um, at this point, you can look in Luke chapter 4 and some of the other gospels, and he also says there, sight to the blind. He doesn't say that in Isaiah chapter 61, but it comes from another part of the Old Testament. Then he says, God has told me to, to say this is the favorable time, and this is real for you, and his anger is real. Listen, he wants to replace death with life. Jesus said that in verse number 3. He said, my righteousness will be built and growing. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says it this way, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us with Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus knew that his job was to redeem those who needed redeeming. Do you understand that? Jesus is not here to make us rich. His job was not to write a self-help book so you and I can feel better about ourselves. In fact, he does want to take away our shame and our guilt. But taking away our shame and our guilt doesn't mean that we can live however the heck we want to. It means we can live with purpose and live with Him. The second thing that Jesus said, I know my purpose. My purpose is to rebuild what is around us. Have you ever seen anything that's broken before? It's just sad. Well, some of the antiques that are broken are kind of cool. But, but sometimes you see an old house that's out there all by itself. And in its day, it must have been beautiful, but it all seems to be broken down. You know what? I've seen some lives like that. I had somebody walk into my office the other day, and they were like uh, um, telling me how old they were, and, and they look like they're... 30-something, and they're 56 years old. I mean, it's just incredible. But have you ever seen anybody who has been strung out, drugs, alcohol, or something like that, and they're 40 years old, but they look like they're 90? Isn't that the way life is sometimes? But, but God has called us to rebuild lives. I, I read a survey. This is for you, Harry. I read a survey the other day. Did you know that if you will quit smoking, within two weeks, your lungs have gained like two years of life? Got four more days, Harry. He's at 10 days right now. Cool. But, but you know what? There is a methodical thing. Research has been done that if you'll just quit doing that smoking, 
things will improve. Your voice will change. On and on. And you know what? There's other things that will. Michael, if you'll just quit eating the way that you're. Well, that's, that's meddling. I need to not go there. <laughs> but the doctor looked at me the other day, and, and he said, this has been about three, three, two, three months ago. He said, if you'll just lose 15 pounds, you won't take metformin for diabetes anymore. Okay? I, but that's true for all of us. I want you to think about that. He is here to rebuild Jesus here in Isaiah chapter 61. This is through the voice of Isaiah, but Jesus spoke it later on. He says he is here to rebuild sometimes those ancient ruins. I remember Nehemiah. Nehemiah was out of the country. He was working somewhere else. He had heard that the gates are burned, the, the walls are down, and he began to be very burdened for his home community. What did he do? He went back. You and I need to understand that what's in the past is the past. It's time to move on. But sometimes to move on, we got to rebuild what's broken. Sometimes it's that broken heart. Let me remind you what bitterness looks like. Bitterness divides, bitterness destroys, and bitterness will take you to places that you don't want to go. Depression, many times, is because we have not dealt with the junk in our past. Therefore, it's going to di- damn our future. You, mm. And I'm just being honest today. If we don't deal with the things that God has brought into our lives and let Him rebuild us, somebody needs to stand up and give a testimony. You know what? God did that for me. I was broken. I was down. And you know what? He rebuilt me into the man or the woman that I am. That's who our God is. He is there. And let me give you Psalms 85, verse number 4. This is a prayer from David. He says, Restore to us. O God of our salvation, and cause your indignation toward us to cease. You ever felt like the anger of God is right toward you? (laughs) Let me tell you what it feels like. Just be in the same room with some godly woman, like Julie, who who just cuts her eyes at you, and you know you did wrong, right? Maybe you're like us, or our kids are like us. Was one of my kids that if you beat, this is Rebecca, (laughs) if you beat Rebecca, she's like, okay, bring it on, I got it. Oh, that didn't hurt. (laughs) Um, But you look at Ruth, and what does she start doing? She just starts crying right there. (laughs) We're made differently. But isn't that the truth? Understanding that all of that junk in our lives that needs to be rebuilt, sometimes it needs to be cleaned out and thrown away. And remember, I am forgiven. Say that. Not only am I forgiven, I'm released from my addiction. Not only am I released from my addiction, I'm released from my past behavior. Why? Because God has future behavior for me that is incredible, and it's for His glory. It is time to understand that God wants to rebuild our lives. And by the way, who does He want to use to rebuild people's lives? You and me. Because He inhabits us. He inhabits the praise of His people. He says here that He'll revive them. By the way, you cannot revive something that's never been alive. And He, he says He wants to bring to life what once used to be alive. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught up in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to himself so that you too will not be tempted. Do you know what we're called to do? To restore others. You see them going the wrong direction? Remind them, that ain't God, and you belong to God. Let's go a different way. We are our brother's keeper, amen? God has restored us. Psalms 23, verse number 3, listen, He restores my soul. Listen, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He is continuing to restore us. You know what? He will rise again. Jesus said that, didn't He? You will tear down this temple, and in three days... And the leaders of the church are like, how in the world? He's not even a contractor. He's a carpenter. What do those carpenters know? David, David Dunham, wherever you are. What do them carpenters know? <laughs> they didn't understand that he was going to rise. Can you imagine what it was to see that grave empty? We, we killed him on Friday. Let's go make sure everything's, oh, my gosh. <laughs> What's going to happen next? My, my Savior, my Jesus, is alive and well today, which... By the way, is a reminder that I don't have to let my past death determine my future living. He is here to revive us. The next thing that he says, by the way, we have authority from God. In, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, really 16 through 20, he says, all authority has been given to me. And by the way, in another place, Jesus said, you will do greater things than I have done. By the way, we have authority from God to speak to demons and tell them to get out. 
in the name of Jesus. Do you know what? We have the authority to tell, listen, to tell this world about Jesus, and it will radically change their lives, and we are to be a part of that. Jesus understood his purpose. He says you're to be a priest for God. What is a priest? A priest is a mediator between God and man. Okay, you and I are not Catholic. We're not Roman Catholic or, or anything else. We don't have to go to a Catholic uh, or to a priest to be forgiven. You know what I'm talking about. You, you know that. But we are priests. Do you know what we can do for others? We can tell them that God's alive. And let me show you. Your testimony, the truth that God has placed in you, is so that you can be a priest to that neighbor whose life is going to hell. Listen to this. That truth is so that we can look at our kids and say, I've been there, and I don't want you to go there, and I want you to see the goodness of God. To be a priest sometimes is to be quiet and to hear from God so that others can hear around me. Listen, you might not like it, but you are a leader. Therefore, be a, listen to his word so that our sons and our daughters and our neighbors and our, and our friends, our co-workers, our relatives and others can see within us that there is life. But by the way, somebody that says one thing and does another, that's a hypocrite. You and I are not priests from God when we live like that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. But you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood. Um, Excuse me, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I want to do that. Anybody else? By the way, we've got false prophets among us. Just turn on the TV. Just go read some of the self-help books today. And you're going to see and understand that there are people that are trying to deceive you or to keep you from following Jesus Christ. Did you know that giving to church doesn't make you a Christian? But it sure makes the preacher happy. Did you know that coming to church doesn't make you a Christian? And, and if you need that as a warning today, I want to tell you, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're going to hell. But I want to tell you today that if Jesus is in your heart, you can stop living like hell. Because Jesus has a better plan for you and for me. He, he wants us to live with purpose, not shadow boxing, but to live with aim, to live in that direction, to go with him in the right direction. We need to understand that God supplies for us. So first of all, I want to tell you today that Jesus has a plan for us, that he has called us. Secondly, there is a result. God gives results to us. When we live for him, when we know and set our aim, he gives us some results. Again, this is from Isaiah chapter 61. And number one, he says, I want to give you double honor. I like that. Can I give you some examples? Thank <laughs> you.